Okay, for this presentation, I'm going to first read a short introduction I wrote about my time in straight, and after that, I'll just talk from memory about the program. All right, at 16 years old, in January of 1986, my parents admitted me into Straight Incorporated, the once heralded drug and alcohol treatment program for adolescents and their families. After completing the five long phases and finally graduating or seven-stepping the program and then being readmitted for a second mini-program, I finally ran away or copped out in November of 1987. By then I was 18 years old. Having been through the notorious straight program twice, I have to say that the experience was so intense and consuming in many ways that it has actually had an ingrained underlying effect throughout my life and I really only began to realize and come to grips with it all as an adult. Although it has been 25 years since I last motivated in group, reached fourth phase, or covered a misbehaving newcomer's mouth with my hands, I continue to have periodic bouts with repressed, unresolved, resentful, regretful, and even guilty memories of the whole unfortunate ordeal. Along with the occasional nightmare where I dream I'm back in group, and trivial feelings of self-doubt, social awkwardness, and mistrust, which I believe straight conditioned in me, my relationships have all been, at times, negatively affected in some way by the manifestation of the straight program's intrusive, demeaning, and demanding methods having shaped some of the person I became as an adult and how I have interacted with the world around me and the ways that I deal with people, situations, and feelings. Admittedly, not every aspect of straight was bad and there are some basic positive elements that I personally gained from adjusting to the program that have been useful life lessons. I also have fond memories of certain people who were in the group with me and of time spent on days off while in the program and getting my first job when I made it to third phase. But there are a variety of disturbing tactics and methods of long-term adolescent rehabilitation quietly being utilized behind the walls in these kinds of addiction and behavior treatment programs that I have come to believe are dangerous and destructive, if not downright sinister, and can cause lasting psychological harm to a young person that can adversely affect them throughout their life. My story is actually a lucky one, because I went through the program at a time when it had supposedly toned things down due to an investigation of abuse by the FBI. So my experience in straight apparently wasn't nearly as bad as many others who had to endure much worse than anything I went through. So I can only imagine how it affected them. Having said that, I personally witnessed and was forced to take part in and was subjugated to what I consider to be systematic verbal, mental, and physical abuse and even subtle forms of torture. So I think the real stories about straight should be told so parents can be made aware of the inherent problems in adolescent treatment programs modeled after the straight program. Since it is difficult for someone to understand what it was like unless they were actually in straight, I thought I would discuss some of the things that I can recall about the program. First, let me say something about the straight logo that we've been seeing. I can't help but think as I watch it that it it looks, uh, on one hand, kind of quasi-religious, like something you might see on a church hymnal book, or it also, on the other hand, looks uh, kind of sinister, like uh, even serpentine, like a couple of snakes, or even from a distance it looks kind of like a snake's head or maybe even a praying mantis you know the shape of it uh, I don't really want to read too much into all that uh, but anyway I can't help but think it does look a little sinister it, it's the SS you know 
But another point about the logo and the prominent straight name, and they had it on all their literature, you know, their logo and things, is that you didn't see it on the front of their building. There was no sign that said straight ink with the little two S's and the heart. So I find that kind of interesting, you know, it, from the onset, because it's no big secret that a lot of kids were tricked into the program. And it just, you know, it's one of those things you notice that straight couldn't put their name on their building or else, you know, it would have been a lot tougher to get a kid in the parking lot, you know. Straight was full of kids who hadn't been convicted of a crime or court ordered to go through any sort of treatment program. And a lot of kids were tricked into the program by their parents. They would take them to this building, uh, which would usually be a warehouse looking type thing, or in my case, it used to be a A&P grocery store building. And you know, that Straight didn't have their name and little heart logo on the front of the building or else kids would know what the place was, you know, or get or suspect what it is and not go in there and possibly run away in the parking lot before they ever get through the door. So once a kid gets in the door, uh, they can't get out because they'll have two upper phasers come guard the door and then take the kid into custody for the rest of the day into it and put them in a little intake room. And those two upper phasers will spend the day with that newcomer and they'll tell them all about the things that happen in the program like uh, being watched when they go to the bathroom and being held by the belt loop whenever they walk anywhere or that they're not going to be able to associate with the person of the opposite sex for the foreseeable future and that they will not be going home for the foreseeable future and things like this. Then at some point the kid realizes that his parents have left them there and they're not getting out without physically getting past these two kids and whoever else may be between them and the front door down the hall. And, uh, you know, then it starts getting a little creepy. They, 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 the intake process culminates with you having to strip all your clothes off, you know, in front of these two strangers and probably another stranger, you know, a staff member will end up in there or something like that. And, you know, naturally some kids don't want to go along with it and the thing is, uh, you're going to take your clothes off. If you don't take them off willingly, they will take them off for you. So that's where the trouble begins, you know. Your parents are no longer there. Uh, they don't know this is going on. You know, some kids resort right there. You have to choose whether you're going to go along with this violation. You know, in most cases there, you know, a lot of these kids weren't there under court order. Uh, they, they weren't being punished for a crime they had committed. They were put in this place for help by their parents. And their parents really weren't bargaining for their kid to all of a sudden be in a physical altercation in the back of some converted grocery store building with a couple of uh, brainwashed kids, you know, into taking all their clothes off and stuff like that, you know. So, you know, I saw kids get belligerent and physical, and I've, when I was on my upper phases, I had to be called out of group to come into an intake room, intake situation where there were four, five, six of us uh, holding down a guy who was being admitted to the program who wanted nothing to do with it. And I have to be honest and say I felt uh, bad in those situations. I knew it was wrong. I knew it was wrong, you know, to be physically handling somebody in a situation like that. At least it was wrong for the kids to be doing it to each other. It just something about it was not it wasn't humane, I guess, for lack of a better term. But anyway, you know, that's the intake process. Looking back, you know, I and I knew then it seemed insidious. It was like a secret society or a cult. You know, they utilized brainwashing techniques. They exploited not just the kids, but the parents. They exploited the parents for money with all kind of fundraisers they were always having to do and that kind of thing. Kids were pitted against each other. Uh, in straight, not only were kids required to talk about any drugs they might have done, but to make it through the program, they were, they were coerced and expected to confess 
as well as verbally and physically express guilt and sufficient regretful emotion in front of the group to having themselves committed shameful, embarrassing, humiliating, even illegal and immoral acts, often including such things as perverted sexual acts, uh, like incest and bestiality, whether, they, whether it was real or whether the kid made it up. You know, and I know a lot of kids did make things up. Uh, myself included, because you soon learned that you had to have done a lot of stuff, you know, bad things during your druggy, drug use, former life before you got into straight. And crimes were confessed daily. In between the rap sessions, the group had to sing songs, kind of like nursery rhyme songs and things. And it was really strange, you know, I, I remember thinking how odd it was. It was, sim it was similar to something, you know, that, that little kids would be doing. And uh, I remember the motivating, it was, you know, it was cult-like. It was very embarrassing and humiliating uh, at first to do. But looking back on it, I remember it being very strange looking, just crazy looking, but now it seems like it was more similar to worshiping, you know, a, uh, an odd worship, uh, like begging or groveling, you know. And uh, the straight staff takes on the role of the God entity, or at least a higher power who you must appease for redemption and forgiveness. The staff was mostly unseen. The levels were trainee, junior and senior who those those levels would all be people who had completed the program and they were basically at the the end levels of the straight program they were in no way professional counselors or anything like that and then there was ex executive staff who really only dealt with the parents and the kids barely ever saw any executive staff now they did have like an, an a executive rap or something like that every blue moon where once a month or something like that, the executive staff would be in the back of group and you would see it, the kids would see them on uh, open meeting nights. But other than that, the executive staff, I really don't know what they were there for other than to rake in the money because they didn't have much hands-on counseling going on at all. I would say that the executive staff mostly, while I was in straight, had, knew nothing about the kids other than what the, the junior or senior staff was reporting to them. When a person gets sat down in group for the first time, they have no idea about all the little rules in straight. Uh, one of the main ones being that you can't talk, you cannot speak out in the group. And a newcomer cannot speak to other newcomers anyway, but you cannot speak in group at all. And I'm talking at all, not one word. So usually the first thing that happens is the the, the newcomer that's just been sat down in group for the first time will inevitably say something to the person next to him. And uh, of course, the, the person next to him kind of shushes them, you know, because they can't speak out either and tell the person that they're not allowed to talk. So there's a communication gap right there. Anyway, the, the newcomer will then attempt to say something else and before he knows it, somebody will put their hand over that newcomer's mouth. And that is when the second instance of violence usually occurs. And I remember it becoming, you know, common to see a newcomer after they were introduced to the group. A few minutes later, you would see a scuffle happen wherever they were sat down in group because they would not realize that somebody was going to wind up putting their hand on them to shut them up. And so that would be the first day in straight and you would sit there in this group of people sitting there and people would be putting their hands down your back to make you sit up because you couldn't sit back in the chair and you didn't understand this and when you tried to ask why you would get motioned to be quiet and a lot of people ended up getting in scuffles or restrained on the floor even because they tried to fend off someone putting their hand on over their mouth that first day. <laughs>